Hello, everyone. My name is Ariella Wagner. I'm the founder of Sunray Construction Solutions. Today, we have a sensational webinar conducted by the fabulous Alex Barthet on Subcontractor's Step-by-Step -step Guide to Getting Paid. So without further ado, I introduce the fabulous Alex Barthet. Thanks, Ariella. Again, my name is Alex Barthet. I am a board certified construction attorney here in Florida. And today we're going to talk about a subcontractor's step by step guide to getting paid. We're going to run through each of the major steps that you need to make sure you follow to increase the likelihood that you're going to get paid. So let's get started. On today's agenda, we have um, each of the steps. So, step one, is your contract. It's gonna be the foundation of what we talk about. Um, and I'm gonna talk about one specific change that you need to make to increase the likelihood that you get paid or at a minimum, you, you, you don't get burned. Um, step two, we'll talk about securing your lien rights. Step three, we'll talk about securing your bond rights if the job is bonded. Step two and three are absolutely critical. Um, we'll talk about some stigma that's associated with it and why I think you should ignore it. And then step four, we'll talk about the right way to exchange a release for a check. Um, clients make lots of mistakes in this process and can give up many of the rights that they actually have. Um, so understanding what the release says and how to exchange releases for checks is critical. Um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and submit them in the GoToWebinar chat box. We will answer all the questions you have at the end. Please make sure not to include the names of any people or companies in your questions. Um, so let's get right into it. Step one, your contract. We're gonna talk about this one change that you need to make. Um, so it really involves the pay when paid clause. Um, so there are lots of provisions in your contract uh, that you may have with a contractor. So you need to make sure, one, that you read the contract. We have a lot of clients that get a contract and uh, they skip right, they skip over all the legal boilerplate and they go right to the terms of the uh, scope of work. And that's what they focus on. That would be a mistake. Um, the, the terms and conditions that are in your contract with a general contractor are absolutely critical to know and understand. You may not be able to change anything um, or very much, but you you need to at least understand where the risks are and one of the biggest risks is the pay when paid clause so a pay when paid clause is a contractual provision that exists in almost every general contract or subcontract we see and it shifts the risk of non-payment from the owner to the subcontractor so if you're a sub on a job and you sign a contract that has a valid pay when paid provision in it and the owner doesn't pay the contractor, the contractor is not legally obligated to pay you. Um, so this is a valid and enforceable legal defense here in Florida to the payment. Um, so if you have a con, so the first thing you need to know is, does your contract have a pay when paid provision in it? I would tell you almost certainly it does. If a contractor is handing you a contract that has, you know, more than a couple of paragraphs of terms and conditions, there's probably a pay when paid provision in it. So how do you deal with it? Um, so the first thing you need to understand is that you should be actively trying to modify the contracts that are given to you as a subcontractor. Do not just assume that, well, if, if I don't sign it, I'm not gonna get the work. I'm here to tell you that every contractor is gonna tell you that their contract is non-negotiable, and every contractor in, in most instances are willing to negotiate their contract. Um, and the way that's done is with an addendum. So you can mark it up by hand if you want, but most contractors prefer an addendum, which is an add-on page to the contract that says, here are the, here are the per terms and conditions that are modified and changed. One of them should be the pay when paid provision. So again, we. You could try to strike it, that probably won't happen. Um, but here is the next best thing that you can do. You can add a stop work provision in your contract. Um, and we're, I'm gonna explain how that works. The other thing that you need to know uh, so that you can properly deal with a pay when pay provision is 
if the job is bonded, you need to make sure you, you, you secure your bond rights. And if you have lien rights, you secure your lien rights. Those last two points are absolutely critical in overcoming a pay when paid provision. And I'll explain why in a minute. So let's talk about this stop work provision. So I told you what a pay when paid provision is. You could try to remove it from the contract. That likely will not happen. So most contracts um, have a provision that says something like this. Subcontractor shall not be entitled to stop the work on account of a contractor's default, including non-payment, but shall proceed with the dispute resolution procedures in the agreement. So what does that mean? Um, why is that so scary? The reason it's so scary is because if the owner is not paying the contractor and therefore the contractor doesn't have to pay you, but you still need to pay your vendors, your labor, that means you're doing what? You are financing this project. You are doing the work, you are spending money, um, you're delivering materials, you're installing product, but you are not getting paid. Um, that's one very quick way to potentially go out of business. Um, so what can you do about it? While you may not be able to strike the pay when paid provision, one of the things you should be able to do is add in a stop work provision. So here's an example. Subcontractor may slow or suspend work if any payment requests have not been paid in full within 30 calendar days from submission. Not every contractor is gonna to agree to this. Not every contractor will agree to 30 days. Maybe they'll agree to 45 days or 60 days. Um, the, the important thing is that there has to be a point in time when if you are not being paid, you have the right to stop work because the provision that I read to you about your obligation to keep working when even when you're not paid is potentially a death sentence to your business. So you need a way out and this is one of the ways to do it. In my experience as a construction lawyer for more than 20 years, um, when I'm asked, Alex, what is the most, if you could only make one change to, to a contract, what would it be? It would be to add a stop work provision. It is that important that you have that right to be able to stop work if you're not getting paid. So uh, if you have bond rights on a job, securing your right to be paid on the project by timely sending the surety a notice of non-payment is critical because a surety in most instances, not every instance, but most instances are not entitled to assert the pay when paid defense. So that means you sign a contract with a GC, it has a pay when paid provision, um, but the job is bonded, you make a claim against the contractor's bond, the surety can assert every defense of the of its principal, the general contractor. Your work was no good. You were late. We had to supplement your forces. The one defense that they usually cannot assert is the pay when paid defense, which is usually the most significant one. So if you have a bond claim, you need to timely assert it. We'll talk about that on how to do that in a minute. Um, but the main reason why is so that you can overcome this pay when paid defense. Um, and if you have lien rights, you need to secure your lien rights. And the reason is, is that an owner is not entitled to assert the pay when paid defense. If the, if the owner hasn't paid the contractor and therefore the contractor doesn't have to pay you, the owner is still obligated if you have lien rights to pay you. So securing your rights to be paid on the project with a lien are absolutely critical. So that's step one. Let's talk about step two, a little more details on securing your lien rights. So what are the steps in order to secure your lien rights? One, the contract price between the owner and the contractor needs to exceed $2,500. This almost always occurs. Um, the notice to owner must be served on all interested parties no later than 45 days from the first labor or furnishing of materials on the project. We'll get into that in a minute on exactly how you calculate the 45 days and what that means. You need to record your claim of lien no later than 90 days from your last date of work on the project or last, delayed, last date of material delivery. Again, these dates, 45 and 90, absolute last day when these things must occur. So you shouldn't be waiting that long. Um, you need to serve a copy of the claim of lien on all interested parties within 15 days of recording. Um, know that if you use Sunray for your 
um, notices they take care of all of the people that need to get it. Um, if you use them for your lien, they make sure all the people that need to get it receive a copy within those 15 days as well. And then you need to file a lawsuit to foreclose on your lien no later than one year from your last date of work, sorry, from the one year from the recording date of the claim of lien. Um, so those are the key dates that you need to keep in mind. Again, you should not be waiting to the end on any of these dates in order to secure your rights. Um, a few common traps that we see to keep in mind, by the way, these apply to the next section as well, which are the, the bond claims. Um, all days are calendar days. So it's not 45 work days for the notice to owner, it's 45 calendar days. Um, same with the claim of lien 90 days. Um, with respect to the date of last work, it, it cannot be um, punch list or warranty work. Um, and then the 90 days is not three months, right? Some months have more than 30 days. Some months have fewer than 30 days. So you need to make sure that you're actually counting the number of days. Know that when the last day, the 90th day, falls on a weekend or legal holiday, it rolls to the next day. So if the 90th day is a Saturday, it goes to Sunday, um, which then goes to Monday. And if Monday, for example, the courts are closed, so nothing can get recorded, then it goes to the next business day, which would be Tuesday. Um, but those are exceptions. Again, you should not be waiting to the last minute for any of this. Um, all of the timelines that I talked about are the dates when the documents have to be either filed for a lien or received for the notice to owner, not delivered. So if on the 90th day you decide I'm going to prepare my lien today, you know, if the clerk's office isn't open, um, you know, keep in mind they close at four o'clock and COVID has been very challenging. Only now recently have the clerk's office been open to accept anything in person. Um, many times we had to submit it electronically, which usually took anywhere from two days to a week. Um, so if you're waiting to the last minute, it's going to be a problem. And the notice to owner, the 45 days is the day when the owner um, needs to receive a copy of that document in the mail. So if it's getting mailed out on day 44 and it arrives on day 46, your notice to owner is too late. So you cannot wait to the last minute for any of this. You should be doing all of this early. So those are your lien rights. That Those are the steps on how to assert your lien rights. Let's talk about asserting your rights to make a bond claim. So a payment bond issued by the contractor secures your rights to payment. So instead of a lien on the property, you have a claim against this surety bond. It's, an, it's, a, uh, it's like a financial instrument that keeps the property free and clear of lien. So if you have a claim, you make it against the surety bond, you leave the property out of it. How do you know if the job is bonded? Well, if you use Sunray, they're gonna do that research and then they will make sure that the proper notice goes out, whether it's a lien or a bond claim. But if you wanted to check yourself, you need to take a look at the notice of commencement. The notice of commencement should reference if the job is bonded. A copy of the bond is supposed to be attached to the notice of commencement. All of this is available in the public record. Um, if you ask Sunray to send you a copy, they will. If you go to the job trailer, they, they are supposed to have a copy of the notice of commencement and bond if, it, if the job is bonded, posted at the job site or in the job site trailer, available for you to get a copy of. Um, none of this is supposed to be a secret. You should be able to get it very easily. So the first step, is what's called the notice to contractor. And that is a, a document that needs to be served no later than 45 days from the first furnishing of labor materials on the job site. So if you are a subcontractor and your contract is with the bonded general contractor, you don't need to send this first notice, this first 45 day notice. I strongly encourage that you do. Um, our advice is that you should have a system in your office where you determine any job over X dollars, we're gonna serve notice to owners, we're gonna record liens, we're gonna serve notices of non-payment. And those um, documents should be automatic in your office. So, but if 
there are certain times when maybe things fall through the cracks and you think, oh, I didn't send my notice. This is actually one of the exceptions. If you have a direct contract with the bonded contractor, then you do not have to serve this notice to owner slash notice to contractor. Um, and the main reason is, is that the contractor who is the principal on the bond that was issued by the surety knows that you have that you're on this job. You don't need to give them notice that you're there because you have a contract with them. So that's why you as a subcontractor to the bonded contractor don't need to serve this first notice. Okay, so the notice of non-payment is the second document that needs to go out. You do need to serve this document on private projects. So a um, notice of non-payment is a document in writing, needs to be sworn to just like a lien, and it needs to arrive at the contractor and surety's office no later than 90 days from your last work or delivery of materials on the project. Another exception you should be aware of on public projects, so uh, a library, uh, you know, a courthouse, um, any type of public job where the owner of the project is the is a city or county, um, those projects are typically bonded. If you are a sub and you have a contract with the bonded contractor, you technically don't need that first notice, that notice to owner within 45 days. And on a public job, when you're a sub to the bonded contractor, you don't need to serve this second notice, this notice of non-payment within 90 days. On private projects, you do. On public projects, you don't. That being said, again, I just strongly encourage you, you just have a process in your office that anytime these things happen, this paperwork just um, gets done. You don't really just try to think about all of the rules and exceptions because there are many and they are complicated. So the last step is filing the lawsuit on a bond. You must file the lawsuit no later than one year from your last delivery of materials or labor to the job site. Remember on a claim of lien, we said it was one year from the recording date of your claim of lien. It's not one year from the time you serve your notice of non-payment on the bond. So technically you actually have 90 more days, up to 90 more days, uh, to sue on your lien claim than you do on your bond claim. So if you're going to remember one rule on when you have to file a lawsuit, remember the earlier rule, and that is you have to file your lawsuit no later than one year from your last delivery of uh, work or materials to the job site. Again, I cannot stress this enough. You should not be waiting that long. Okay, step four, exchanging a release for a check, how to do it the right way. So you should ideally be using the statutory forms. Those are found in chapter 713. Um, if you go to theleanzone.com, uh, you can find these forms on our form section of the website. Uh, if you use Sunray, those are the forms that they use when you process releases through their release online release system. Um, but you may be asked to sign a release form that's very different than the ones that's, that are found in the, the statute, which are the very simple, it's like two or three lines. And these exceptions are if you sign a contract and that requires a specific release, then that's the release you've contractually you're contractually obligated to provide. So when you review your contract and you see that it has all these exhibits, one of those exhibits may in fact be a form of release that you're gonna have to sign every time you get paid. If you have an objection to that form of release, the time to object is at is when you're negotiating the contract. Um, the other reason that you may be asked to sign a release that is different from the statutory form is because of what's called the golden rule, right? We all know what the golden rule is. Um, he who has the gold makes the rule, right? The contractor says, well, I don't care what the contract says. I don't care what the law is. 
if you want your check, you need to sign this release. And then if that happens, you need to make a business decision on how you're going to handle it. And typically the best thing to do is to pick up the phone and call a experienced construction lawyer who may help guide you through that process and give you some ideas of things to do and not to do in that situation. But I am very aware that that happens on a regular basis in construction. So a couple of things to keep in mind with respect to the lien waivers. Um, is the waiver for an amount of money only or for a period of time? Um, most often, I would say 98%, 99% of the time, it's always for a period of time. Um, you just need to make sure that the amount of money and the time in that release coincide. They make sense because the date of that release is almost always going to control over the amount of the release. So, for example, if you're expecting a $10,000 check, and that $10,000 check is supposed to get you to the end of the month. So this month's payment is $10,000. Um, you show up to the pick up the check and they only have $8,000 for you. And you sign a release that has a through date through the end of the month. That's the time period. Even though you only picked up $8,000, that lien release, that release is good through the end of the month. So you've just given away $2,000 in my example. So you need to make sure that the lien amount and the lien through date match. And if they don't, you have to make them match. So if you show up and they only want to give you an $8,000 check, you need to figure out what does that $8,000 represent? Well, maybe it's not the end of the month. Maybe it's the 27th of the month. Maybe it's the 14th of the month. But whatever date that is for the amount of money you're getting, those two things should match and you should change the release so that they do match. Because if you don't, just know that you cannot say later, well, yeah, I gave you a release to the end of the month, but you only gave me $8,000. So the $2,000 that you didn't pay me, you still owe that to me. Legally speaking, they don't because you gave up those rights. Um, don't believe anything about the title of the document. Um, just because it says partial doesn't mean that you didn't give up your rights through the end of the month um, uh, or through a period of time that may be later than what you expected. So just because you, for example, I have had, had clients tell me this, right? So they say, well, Alex, I don't know what the problem is. Yeah, they didn't give me the full check, but the release says partial. Yes, it says partial, but it's through the end of the month and you are owed more money through the end of the month and you gave up all of those rights pursuant to the terms of this release. So you need to read the document. Don't just rely on the title of the document to have an understanding of what it means and how it works. If you have other claims, retainage, pending claims, RCOs, PCOs, delay claims, any other claims, unpaid specific invoices, however you want to carve those out, those need to be carved out of your release because if they're not and you release everything through the end of the month, then everything is released through the end of the month. So you need to make sure that if there are rights that you want to preserve, that you create exceptions in the release. This release does not include uh, retainage and PCO 7, 11, and 14. Um, if you don't do that, you could be releasing those rights um, in the future and not be able to get paid for them. Uh, finally, conditional waivers. Uh, again, the Sunray releases have this language in them. Again, there's different ways to write it, but if you are exchanging a release, you're giving someone a release and you're expecting a check, but the check is not arriving immediately, like you're not actually handing it over uh, as you give them the release, then, those, then your releases need to be conditional. And the language uh, could look like this. This release is conditioned upon payment of the consideration described above and is not effective until set amount is received in paid funds by the undersigned. Um, so if you're expecting a $10,000 check 
you don't want to send an unconditional release before you get the check. You want to send them a conditional release that's conditioned on getting $10,000. And then when they, when you get the money, that release is effective because the condition has been satisfied. You received the $10,000. Just know that you cannot make a conditional release conditioned on $10. So sometimes you're asked to give a $10 release. Just know that there is no such thing as a $10 conditional release. So you have to recite the actual amount of money that you're getting, an $8,000 check, a $100,000 check, whatever it is that has to be part of the release for the conditional language to apply. And with that, Ariella, um, let me know if we have any, any questions. So far, Alex, we do not have any questions. Okay, well, um, then let's wrap up a few things. Uh, we have a podcast, the Lean Zone podcast. That's our blog. Um, we have a podcast every week. You can uh, listen to the podcast on uh, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We go through liens, bond, contracts, and other construction issues. We do these webinars every month. Um, the next webinar is on October 27th from 9 to 9.20. You can sign up at sunraynotice.com forward slash webinars. And October's uh, Halloween themed webinar is scary lean release forms you should never sign um, and examples of those that you should. And we're going to spend uh, the entire time going through specific release forms and explaining what you need to be aware of for each of those release forms so that you don't make any mistakes. If anyone has any questions, you can always email Ariella or myself um, anytime. We'll do whatever we can to try to help you out. Did I miss anything, Ariella? You know what? We did have one question come in. Okay. Um, a consultant seems to be treated differently than an architect or an engineer. How does a consultant protect himself? Um, so there are only, I'm not sure what type of consultant they are, but to have lien or bond rights, um, specifically lien rights, a, you must be either an architect, an engineer, a land surveyor, or a contractor slash subcontractor, um, to have lien rights, um, or material supplier. Uh, or vendor, but a consultant like an owner's rep um, typically does not have lien rights. Um, so that relationship is going to be governed by the terms of their contract. So whoever asked that question, um, I'm not sure if I answered it, but feel free to send me an email. I would need to have a better understanding of, of the scope of services that you provide um, when you say that you are a consultant. Um, because that that term is not a defined term typically in the lien law. Um, the question, the gentleman that asked the question is actually a roofing consultant. Yeah, that there's no um, there's no specific right to a roofing consultant having uh, having lien rights. Um, so, for example, if you go out on a roof and you provide an opinion, uh, but you didn't do any actual roofing work, and you're not an engineer or an architect that rendered a, a, a professional service, you don't have lien rights. So you'll have whatever rights you have based on your contract, whoever hired you, what those contract terms and conditions are. Um, but, but in al almost every instance I can think of, you won't have, you won't have lien rights. I think that he's probably what, what a lot of people um, experience is their insurance and um, how do they get paid from situations like that. And again, if you're not making any type of an improvement to the property, unfortunately, you do not have lien rights. So, Correct. But again, send me, send me an email. I'm, I'm happy to try to elaborate further. Um, OK, thank you very much, everybody, for, for uh, participating. Again, if you have questions, give me a call, send us an email. And uh, until then, we'll see you at the, the next webinar. Wonderful. Have a sunny day, everyone.